let's start the last session of the day, which has a bit of a broader focus. And our topic now is financial decision making on the internet. Uh, my name is Andrea Rector. I'm head of the financial desk of Süddeutsche Zeitung, national German newspaper. And um, until 20, um, 2014, I was the bureau chief of Süddeutsche Zeitung in Frankfurt, so reporting from the heart of the financial hub in Germany. So two of our panel speakers you have already seen and heard. One is Lars, who jumped in for um, Klaus Ludwig from the BMF, from the Financial Ministry, and he will cover the regulations part. Thank you that you came in so um, shortly. And you already know Nathan, of course, you have uh, heard the last a couple of minutes ago. And uh, I've got two new panelists here with me. One is Florian. He is founder of, uh, one of the founders of Scale of Capital, a robo-advisor here from Munich. He studied in Munich and has worked for more than eight years, I think, in London and New York for Goldman Sachs. And um, um, in an interview, one of the founders said that Scalable is going to be a big thing, and I'm curious to hear more about that big thing. <laughs> Daniel, to my left, is the lead counselor at Raisin, also FinTech. Some of you might know it um, with their brand Welch Farm. It's an online marketplace for term deposits worldwide. And before joining the burden based fintech, Daniel worked for well known law companies, one of them is Hangar Mirror in, in Dusseldorf. He earned his law degree in Casa and was a visiting researcher at Harvard as well. Okay. Um, if you talk in Germany about financial decision making, there's no way not to refer to Andre Castellani. Some of you might have know him. He died in 1999, but many, many people know his quotes still today. And there's one quote I want to start this debate with, uh, which is, in stock markets, in stock markets is often the gut feeling that tells you what to do. It's the brain that tells you what to avoid. So the gut feeling versus the brain was a red line for a long time. In the old world, where traders were shouting at each other on the trading floors, um, today, you can hear a stock exchanges maximum a small hum of computers. So the financial markets have changed a lot. So Lars, I'd like to pass you the first question. Would you agree that the line has shifted from gut feeling versus brain to human work versus machines? Um, okay, I, I guess in, in some areas of the market, for instance, if you think about uh, high frequency trading or something like that, I think there is simply no way that you uh, can outperform a machine as compared to a human being. And I guess on the other hand, uh, what also happened, uh, what is like my personal gut feeling, is that, uh, that the markets, uh, as they have moved in the past, are no longer that uh, predictable, uh, as a lot of policy changes have moved in, and everything became much more riskier, and uh, so your, your gut feeling might not that well anymore, and not be that well anymore as it was in the past, where market markets were less influenced by big policy or political events. Mm -hmm. Ethan, when I listened to your presentation, I was um, asking myself if people who invest in crowd investing, do they even take the financial decision or is it more emotion or the pure of feeling? So I think that's a really good question and we actually don't know enough about the micro foundations about why people are making the decisions they do. So it's unclear whether in some ways it's about gut decisions aggregated out over time are better or whether it's the fact that some people work on guts and some people work on uh, with numbers and it kind of comes together. I think the important qualification is that we know a lot about, that we know that a human should be making large scale financial decisions, but we still aren't very good at computerizing early stage investment. So there's still a lot of gut in that and I don't necessarily think taking that all out at this point is, is valuable. Let's um, continue, Daniel. Raisin is um, a fintech that uh, promises to raise your interest rate, which is a very good idea in the area <laughs> of low interest rates. But can you maybe dig into that a little bit more, how um, 
that technology you use does help in financial decision making. Mm -hmm. When comes the technology in your fintech? Yeah. So basically, as, as you explained, we're a neutral platform uh, making deposit products from banks across Europe available to, to customers across Europe. So as a German customer, to buy a Spanish or Portuguese or Swedish deposit product. So we're a neutral platform, which means we don't want to influence the, the customer's decisions in a substantive way. But we, of course, what we do want to do is actually get the customer to take a decision at all, so to overcome the natural inertia of customers to procrastinate in terms of the financial decision making. And that's where our technology really comes in. So this means, uh, first of all, ad techs and marketing technology, we use a lot of uh, technology uh, to optimize the, the circumstances and the, uh, and the way at the point in time when we approach the customer to actually uh, increase and, and, and maximize their likelihood to, to take the decision to actually uh, talk and think about their finances now. So that's, that's, that's where a lot of our, our uh, IT and intelligence goes into. And, and the second part, I guess, is as much IT as maybe process and legal uh, innovation is we want to make it as simple as possible for the customer to actually conclude the contract and, and get the product that he wants to and uh, eliminate all the steps in between, or eliminate all the paperwork uh, so that in the ideal world the customer has, has an intention to now uh, you know, buy a deposit product and five minutes later he's got it. And that's what we're trying to do using all kinds of, of legal, tech, and, and other uh, innovation. Um, Scalable is a robo-advisor. Can you explain a little bit your technology? What's behind the, your decision-making process? Yeah, our product is, is quite different from, from, from Daniel's business. In Daniel's world, it's about, it's about fixed income, yeah, and you basically compare different interest rates. Uh, we invest on behalf of our clients into the capital market, so it's about uncertainty, a bit like in the, in the crowd investing space. And, what we realized in, in our careers in the, in the financial services industry was that a lot of people don't want to make decisions when it's about their investments, when it's about their um, retirement savings. And uh, so we build an investment manager, and investment manager is making decisions on your behalf. You only have to decide on, on two things. How much do you want to give us? And like, how shall we invest in it? How much risk in our case? Yeah? And once you make those, decision, uh, this, uh, those two decisions, we make all the little decisions along the way for you. So we, we pick the right instruments. In, uh, we do the portfolio reallocations, and not just once, but over time. How, when the market changes, your circumstances change, change over time, and we make all these decisions for you along the way. And technology we use in several places. We help you with technology with the first uh, two decisions. So how much shall you invest with us, and um, how much risk shall you take, depending on your uh, personal circumstances, where we employ technology and like um, yeah, calibrate our models versus like the, the crowd in some way, because we, we collected a lot, lot of data already, and based on the decisions the clients made, we can give better recommendations for future clients and also for existing clients. And once you are a client, we use technology to um, yeah, invest your money in an efficient way for so you. you. also use kind of the crowd. We use the crowd to refine our, I mean, our crowd is uh, our, our clients, and uh, we can uh, make uh, use of the data we gather from interaction of our clients with our platform. And so when clients go through our, like there are like billions or more uh, combinations how you, how you can go through our onboarding survey, yeah? and then clients make those two decisions in the end, how much risk they take and how much they invest with us. And uh, even those two decisions, they sound quite simple, but they are they are big decisions if you're talking about like uh, half of your savings. Yeah? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and we help our clients by, by uh, mining the data we gathered from our clients and map it versus the decisions they made over it. Mm -hmm. How important is uh, artificial intelligence in your field? I mean, it's a, it's a buzzword, but it's, it's about that to calibrate, like it's about calibrating models and uh, running regressions and uh, it, it's, uh, it's about that, yeah. Mm -hmm. But we, we don't use it heavily like in the investing part of our product, yeah. um, but we use it um, to make our <coughs> application smarter. Yeah. This is where we use it. Like how how you interact. What do you, what, what? How often do you want to like? We have a product where we invest into the capital market, and the securities move every second. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and you could like inform your clients every other second that hey, your portfolio is not now up 0.3 of a percent, like down again. And uh, what we now do is we basically analyze the patterns, how often people look into the app to calibrate how often we notify them about performance in their portfolio. Yeah, so do not annoy them, but provide them with a reasonable level of uh, notifications. Yeah, yeah, I, I, separate question I'll ask later, so it's good. <laughs> okay. Lars, um, if you look at the, um, the financial markets and the financial marketing, the decision-making processes, what do you think has changed if you compare the view of a private customer 10 years ago, maybe, and today? Okay. How would you describe that change? I think just uh, actually coming, I think the just the comment and what you were asking, I think they are kind of related. Of course, uh, like if you were saying that uh, you have technology or intelligence, uh, like uh, when you actually inform your customers about uh, when they should make a decision, I think it's more like now a guidance or something. But in the end, like the customer itself, I think probably you can also calibrate it and say like I want to look at this every five minutes or every five days or something. So. It feels like he has to still make the same decisions, and uh, also in the end, I'm I'm always wondering like how much intelligence is actually in there because, um, as you all know, it's pretty difficult to beat the market on the long run. <laughs> and then uh, if you say like probably you couldn't make your strategies transparent because if you do that, uh, everyone could easily replicate it, um, so it must be somehow hidden. And then I'm wondering like what the strategy would be that is beating the market uh, over a long period and uh, whether it's like, I think in the early days of uh, robo-advisors simply buying ETFs. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if you not just can do this by yourself as an investor, so you're actually saving the, the transaction costs you would have by investing in a robo-advisor. So... I take it to asking people in finance when I meet them in the category, how long do you think that before the median job in your field is replaced by a robot, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, not the best, there's always room for the best, but sort of the middle middle level here. Um, so I, I think that it, it becomes a question of on, on the high end self-evolving strategies that happen faster and on the low end you're not supposed to do anything, right? So the more attractive you can make doing nothing, the better the duty that you do is, right? Well, the doing nothing part is a, is, a, is a very important thing. So the algorithm and robo-advisor is not just about the investing part. Obviously, there, we employ a lot of technology and, and also like smart people from, from academia and from, from the industry to refine our models. And refining our models is about, I mean, there are 1,500 different index funds available in Europe. Yeah? How do you pick the right ones? And do you want to do that yourself every other quarter? Yeah? Because the prices are changing all the time. There, there are new, new players coming into the market. Do you want to manage your portfolio yourself? And the answer of our clients and 90%, 95% of the population is no, they don't want to do it themselves. Yeah? I manage portfolios of ETFs for, for, my, for my siblings and my, my, my parents, and uh, it's a lot of work in the end. Yeah, it's not about, like, you, you invest once, but you have to rebalance, things change, tax, uh, the tax environment changes, you have to adapt, and most people don't want to do it. Often they can't do it because they don't have the expertise or knowledge, but, uh, or, but most, most people just can't be bothered taking care of it themselves. And yeah, they have their periods of, uh, of motivation where they look into this, and then they don't touch their portfolio for years, and maybe it's, like, completely off balance. Uh, so a uh, robot is much more than uh, than the investment model. It's it's all like how you get the portfolio. If you have excess cash, how quickly can you deploy it? Yeah? If you if you are with us and you have like whatever you 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 got uh, you got a bonus and you have like five thousand euros to invest. If you do it yourself, you have to like invest in four or five different ETFs. Talk about ice and tin tons pins. You have to enter everywhere. Yeah? With us, you tap uh, plus enter the number of 5,000 and hit go and it's invested. Uh, it's, it's just a different experience than, than doing it yourself. Well, uh, well, Daniel, your customers do have a different uh, strategy if they work with you. Well, I mean, I guess our customers are, are uh, probably the demographic would be similar, but, but uh, the investment end is very different and we're the product, so the most secure and simple product, the, the no, no fancy stuff in there. 
Um, so the, the, as I mentioned, the innovation is, is really making it as simple for them as possible <coughs> to, to trust. I mean, our customers are 55 years on average, 75% uh, male, above, above average uh, education, but they, they, they tend to look at details. They're not like impulse driven, they, they read the stuff. They make uh, astonishingly uh, rational decisions, so they're not going for the high interest rate all the time. They actually see that uh, the country rating is an important factor in a, in a deposit if you compare cross border. And uh, so um, they uh, they uh, they are they can be bothered to some extent to go through the details, and they're doing it. But yet uh, uh, making making it as simple as possible is a key success factor. Mm. But still, it's the customer who takes. The, all the decisions yes. where you take the decisions for your customers. In the case of, because we invest in the, into, the, uh, into the capital markets, but what is somewhat simpler, uh, similar across the two platforms, and they, this is fixed income and or like deposits, and we are in, in, uh, in the capital markets, but uh, what is similar is you need to make it as simple as possible. Uh, there are like, for those people who want to do it themselves, there are tools out there. Like the innovation happened in brokerage. Yeah, since 15 to 20 years, like there are brokerage firms out there where you can invest very easily and for a, for very low commissions if you want to do it yourself. But most people can't and don't want to do it themselves. And there you need platforms who help them. Yeah, and in in, in Raisin's case, it's about not opening, uh, not not having to open uh, fill out forms or opening bank accounts with with banks all over Europe. Yeah? In some areas you can't even open it cross-border yourself, but even if you don't want to do it yourself. And in our case, it's about not making those investment decisions all the time. Now, you give us a mandate, it's like uh, Uber is your private driver and we are your private investment manager. And our service previously has only been accessible for very rich people. Now, investment management is not a new business, but having someone who takes care of your portfolio without you being involved in the past was something where the entry hurdle was at a million dollars. Mm. And that changed with technology. Mm. I always like when uh, fintechs say that they want to keep it simple, but I also think, I, I was always wondering if it's really easier than years ago to take financial decisions because there's just so, there are so many options on the table. There's crowdfunding, there's, um, you both, two of you, you get, you, we've got the whole range of fintechs. On the one hand, on the other hand. Um, so, uh, Lars, what's your take on that? Do you think it's easier for the customers? Today? I think not at all. I think, uh, I mean, for us, like if you look into particular products, and uh, so, for instance, if you look into the crowd investing contracts nowadays, I think it took us uh, a couple of hours probably to figure out what the share actually is you are actually buying and what your participation rights are. And I think, like, we are on the probably upper side of uh, the financial to understand those financial contracts. And I think for a regular uh, user or investor of, of, of these products, it's not at all easier than before. And I think if they just bought a simple product like a stock or something, that would have been probably a much easier decision because it's much easier to understand in the end. Mm -hmm. And I think for other products, that is probably equally valid. Um, Maybe a, a little anecdote, because we were really struck by, by the effect that uh, our products being listed at the Schiffel Magen test what that effect had actually on our inflows. Uh, and we would have thought, you know, our customers are online savvy, they, they, they go through the details, they Google stuff, but the printed finance test paper uh, is actually, the magazine is actually the, 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 one of the most important drivers in inflows. It's still partly explained out in the graphics, of course. Yeah. I think uh, within each silo, it's about the, um, the platforms to navigate complexity. Like uh, Kickstarter needs to crack navigating the complexity in crowdfunding and other platforms and platforms like Raising need to navigate within deposits and we do it in our space. But one thing, and this is really a problem we hear more and more often from our clients, is about your overall asset allocation. And this is an answer we don't give right now. And we don't help our clients in, uh, with how much should go into buying a house here in Munich and how much should be on a deposit uh, with Raisin and how much should be with scalable capital and how much shall I, shall I put into a crowdfunding project or whatever. So this is um, like this financial planning hasn't been that automated yet. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some businesses uh, moving into that direction to like uh, have a product agnostic financial planning in a, in a, in a digital realm. <laughs> With your business model. Yeah, we. I mean, we, we want to really focus about what uh, 
what we uh, what we are good in, and that's uh, that's like the investment management part in, in the in the liquid uh, capital markets. Uh, we we are not the best. Uh, uh, like uh, we don't have expertise in real estate investing. It's just not our expertise, and it's tough. Like financial planning has the has the complexity that you have to know a little bit about everything. The question is how. How good are you then in that? And especially about the customers, so everything plays a role, like how many children are there, you know, if yeah. there's hedges and so on. So. So there's a great little survey I read of, of five uh, U.S. Nobel Prize winners in economics a couple years ago, of which three had not properly contributed everything they should be to their individual retirement accounts in the United States, yeah. right? Even though they knew they should do this, and they were Nobel Prize winners, right? So I think that you're overest underestimating the complexity before and how much the default option was no choice, right? And the big challenge is, and I think the other thing is, a lot of the things we're talking about help wealthy individuals or moderately wealthy individuals or move the barrier down. So it used to be really, really, really rich to do this, now you just have to be well off. But there's still a large number of people who, all of this is too complicated and services are too complicated. And that's, I think, the kind of the fu- you know, future challenge, right, of this set of stuff. We're talking about, about that um, investing is so complex and it's getting deeper, even complexer every day. There's a big need yeah. for strong consumer protection, isn't it? Do you think here as a panelist that consumer protection, when it comes to those new uh, fintechs, is in a good shape? Do we need more? Is it too much? What do you think? So I would say it's a love and hate relationship. So of course uh, our customers are consumers. We want to be as transparent and as reliable as possible. So we want to comply with any consumer protection laws there are out there. Uh, on the other side, we do see, um, for example, data protection agencies uh, who are not aware of what's going on out there. So we we get a data a data com- a, a protection complaint uh, from the Berlin Data Protection Officer who is not aware that the, the thing we did. So what we did is we sent the, the pre-filled uh, application form as a PDF document per unencrypted email to the customer, which is something we need to do uh, uh, by nature of, of consumer protection laws. They had data protection in mind. They said it's unencrypted. You cannot do it even if the customer consents to it. So this shows that they're like far away sometimes from from what's going on in practice and even what's what the legal obligations are in, in this particular case. So and also Stuck and Wand tests, uh, they had a hard time at the, uh, at the beginning to actually embrace our products because it was somehow online and uh, you know you know Bulgarian banks were somehow involved and it's not not entirely clear. So they set up uh, a list of criteria which we fulfilled, and then they told us there is a subset or an additional set of secret criteria which we didn't fulfill. So we said, you know, guys, this is not how it works. You know, either we comply with the official criteria, and in the end, we convinced them. Uh, but so it's a love and hate relationship. As I mentioned, it's extremely important. Uh, and Shukumat has one, uh, just taking this example again, uh, being on there is extremely important. So it's 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 uh, not not clear. And so I, I had a, my first chance of really, um, I don't know if there's a German equivalent expression, but of seeing the sausage made in the United States watching the crowdfunding laws move ahead because uh, I've talked to the SEC on a couple of occasions. Uh, and you know, it was just interesting because the problem is that there's a natural conflict between letting people do stuff, right, that increases risk and um, you know, even crowdfunding. And uh, and the more restrictions you put on it, the less useful this, the, these crowd-based institutions work, right? So, um, so the SEC had a very different set of requirements than Congress did, uh, and I think the SEC won more than you know as the end result took two years to make the rules, um, and I think they were restricted enough that we're not seeing stuff happen. Now, on the other hand, could there be a lot more fraud? I mean, it's hard to imagine that you can. You know, if you limit losses and allow experimentation, it becomes the real question. Um, and at least, I don't know, again, I don't know German law, but in the US, there's a, the accredited investor criteria, which is if you earn over a certain amount a year, you're just considered to be smart about finances, and most things don't apply and you do stupid things. Um, but, you know, so the question is just how do you set up these criteria? Regulation is definitely needed because exploitation always happens. Um, but, you know, is there a way to limit losses and allow but still allow innovation to happen becomes the, the push. Because limiting all losses means nothing nothing occurs. I mean, in, in our space, uh, we have to segment regulation in various uh, in things like the KYC and anti-money laundering, and this applies to all of us. And uh, here, it's sometimes a bit difficult to, to kind of reinvent the, the rules which have been um, 
designed for like offline processes with web signatures and going to a branch office to bring them to the online world without uh, making it more easy for uh, for um, for crime to uh, to exploit the rules. Um, but for our product itself, we actually have um, the regulators have been quite supportive for what, for what we do because uh, because they like how how the, the technology um, makes the, the process like uh, you have a clear audit trail for everything. It's more standardized. Like people sitting in front of their screen and going uh, through a survey. It's a more neutral place than being in the back room of a bank branch and someone like like really pushing you into, into a specific product. Like they, they, they like it and they, they like how, how transparent everything is and how they, can, um, how, how they can also audit these things and look how people, the, about our questions and the answers clients gave and what we actually recommended, that there's like a clear link between what the customer wants and what we actually offer. So in that space, they were actually uh, quite supportive. But the biggest difficulty is just to the, the pace of innovation yeah, and, and like the pace of regulation to, to keep up with that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's also been some kind of regulatory competition. If you look at the um, uh, London, uh, the Great Britain's um, um, regulation, they have put a sandbox for fintechs. Do you think that's a good idea? Can I jump in here? <laughs> <laughs> no. Having, having, <laughs> having applied for, uh, because we, we have, uh, we have two subsidiaries, one in Germany and one in the UK, and they both have run the same business. Investment management, one for the German market, one for the UK market, and we didn't go for a passport, but we really have a license in both markets. And the, we, we kicked it off at the same time, and uh, even though BaFin and Bundesbank, they don't, don't talk about fintech sandboxing and, uh, and, and like are not very present on all the conferences, like they were twice as fast in processing our license and giving us a permit to conduct our investment management service in the German market and in the UK. <laughs> Hopefully the FCA is not listening. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, okay, so there is a, is a competition and some try to outrun the others, mm -hmm. but is that a good thing? Or well, I think we cannot tell yet because we don't know how the startups performed it. So it went under this uh, Zenbox regulation as compared to other startups. But I mean, you can, if you think about it, I mean, who are the startups who are actually moving in there? So it's probably these startups who have not as enough capital or resources to comply with the regulation, who don't want to grow that fast. And I'm, I'm thinking like whether you don't have a negative selection having a sandbox approach, because um, if you are a fast growing startup who has enough uh, VC capital or whatever, I mean, they would go, go right for the real thing and not like have a, a, a contract they have to change later on. That's also costly and this slows everything down. And I wouldn't say it's only a positive thing. So it could have positive and negative aspects. Uh, I, I would agree to, to the extent that I, I don't think, I think it's a misconception that, that startups or fintechs are against regulation. I think quite the opposite is true. What we need is, uh, is clear regulation. And so what regulation usually brings about is, is additional complexity and you need to adjust both of things where startups are, are typically very good at. So it actually can be even be a competitive advantage if regulation happens. And uh, and especially for our, in our case, so I'm not sure regulatory competition is the right word, but our business model naturally, so what we do is we take money from German investors and put them into banks in, let's say, Sweden. So uh, in the end, the Swedish uh, deposit insurance scheme will have to pay off German investors, which they don't like. And on the other side, it, it may deep, it may take it takes money out of the uh, German financial system. So both national regulators have a natural tendency to not like the product so much. But looking at uh, having the overall European uh, 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 picture or perspective, uh, it actually integrates it creates a single European market for deposit products. So uh, and that's actually a struggle we sometimes we sometimes face. It's not so much competition amongst regulators, but but uh, but uh, national protection, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, Ethan, when you talk about um, crowdfunding, um, there's the people who invested in the project online and gave their own money, and uh, most of them are retail, small retail clients. Um, what if something goes wrong and then the crowd gets angry? How, what, what, what happens? So um, the answer is, so again, we'll differentiate between two types, reward-based, right, where you're not actually investing, 
Right, so that's a set of categories, but we'll talk about equity, which is more in line with this panel. Um, so it's sort of unclear right now. Um, so they've pushed the whole problem out. Um, portals have, are the responsible entities in some cases, but if they're doing everything right, then responsibility falls to the organization uh, responsible. I mean, it was, you know, whether or not you can ever claim anything from a small fly-by-night retail company that fails is an open question. Um, how you end up making money in the end from these investments, right? Because these are not um, these are not lend, lending investments, but they're equity investments. So that company needs to exit, which implies a high failure rate. So this is the big danger in equity crowdfunding: is you're betting on a lottery ticket, right? Because there is it's not a loan where you're going to get some piece of return. You've heard about how great startups are. You've watched the Social Network movie. You watch you know whatever you call Shark Tank or Dragons Den or whatever here, and you think I want to do that. So failure is part of the game. So that becomes the real question is how do you educate people to the fact that they're going to fail? And then how do you stop, you know, how do you filter, uh, you know, and we, if we solve the problem of figuring out which startups to invest in, um, I wouldn't be here now. I'd just be, you know, using that system. Um, so it's sort of an open question of, um, you know, what do you expect, right? As opposed to these products where it's about limiting downside risk and increasing return, Making everyone a venture capitalist requires a very different attitude, and I don't know if it's a good thing ultimately or not. Okay. Before I come to the audience, I know you had a long day already in your phones, but I'd like to open it up to the uh, public um, after this round. Um, Ethan, you already mentioned in your uh, presentation uh, the word democratization, and that I think that all um, to both of your fintechs also take part in that, um, that you open up something for people that couldn't invest in that special area before. Um, because as you said it before, that usually it's what's only open capital markets were only for rich people. Um, so I'd like to give that question um, to you, Lars. Um, do you think that all the fintech environment helps to dem democratize financial markets? I think absolutely. Uh, I think this morning we, we had a paper on social trading and the, the world was that uh, I mean, everyone can now become a fund manager. I think that already tells us uh, like if you are good in that and you don't need any financial education or like any education at all, like if you're a good person in uh, investing in stocks and you build a nice portfolio or Iondo, uh, whatever, then uh, you're just uh, the person to do that. Um, I think that wasn't possible before. I, I would just say again, I know I've said this before, but this is a two-party process, right? So, you know, I, I like the idea of thinking about the, the global capital flows as having beneficiaries in terms of recipients of the money as well. And I think that's the other question is you're democratizing access not just to the people making the investments, but the people receiving them. Um, and that there's some value there too, because the system wasn't just broken on the investor side. It also meant that the people who received funding before tended to have connections. There tended to be some, you know, reasons for kickbacks or inside games, and that goes away too. So there's benefits on both ends, mm -hmm. potentially. Yeah. Okay, maybe just one, one question because I'm, I'm I'm struggling with the term democratization. Uh, I mean, if we're talking about level playing field, that's I think that's that's good. Democracy is kind of a governance structure, and uh, so my question is. Uh, uh, is it even good to have a democracy in investing? Investing does it lead to the efficient uh, decisions, or uh, or should that decision be left to specialists? I mean, is there? I mean, and I'm sure there's there, there's another data on that. So democratization of opportunity rather than democratization of choice, right? Is is what? So capital markets, both receivers and givers, have been limited to by a combination of regulation and size and difficulty to only a few players. So democratization of access sounds reasonable, but democratization in terms of I want my fund manager to be like a 12-year-old who's kind of hacked together their own fun fund, I'm, I'm okay with that doing that. Yeah. Okay, so I see the first question on the back. Please say a name and maybe who you're referring to. Hello, my name is Marie Meinhardt, I'm from Bernie. And um, I have a question. My issue is sustainable development in terms of putting together economic, social, and um, economic, social, and ecological aspects. And my question to you is um, 
in how far do your um, products and services contribute to sustainable development and um, for um, Professor Mollick, um, I would be interested in um, how in how far does crowd investing contribute to sustainable development? Thank you. Yeah, everyone's looking at me. Um, um, okay, so yeah, I, I'll I'll say first. So um, what's interesting is I had, so I didn't ask in my survey specifically about sustainable development, but I did ask whether they were felt whether the project was contributing to a social good, and asked them to explain which ones. So we're still going through to figure out what they're doing. But um, almost 70% of projects gave me a description about how they were contributing to the social good. So um, there seems to be active interest in it. And again, you know, when you, there seems to be some evidence that the projects that invoke these sort of elements do better. Um, some of the most successful crowdfunding campaign and uh, sites have been things like Kiva, which does micro loans in financing uh, the very poor. Uh, so there's, there's, there is interest in this. Um, not all of it's tied specifically to environment, but at least the idea that it is the social investing platform, there seems to be pent up need, and crowdfunding seems to be addressing some of that. Um, and I'll have more results for you soon as far as a breakdown of how many people use environmental words. It sounds like a really interesting thought, so I'm going to run those numbers and see what I can come up with. Uh, so thank you for that. A quick response from my side. So uh, economic sustainability, I think it's, it's, it's pretty clear. In our, in our business case, we harmonize, we build a European market, so try to help build a European market for deposits, and we help uh, do away with, with market uh, barriers. So we see that uh, European banks, so uh, banks that are active in, in, in European countries, they charge, they, they, they pay very different interest rates for term deposits. So it's one bank, yet they're uh, segregating the markets and uh, to, their, to their benefit. So, so bringing down the barriers uh, on cross-border deposit markets, I think, is, a, is an economically good thing overall. And ecologically, it's good because you don't have to travel to Spain to open a deposit in Spain. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, Raisin is building uh, Europe. What is Scalable doing? Scalable is helping uh, more investors to become uh, better and smarter investors. Yeah? Um, what we don't do, you know, just to directly also answer the question, uh, is, uh, is about really uh, reducing the universe we can invest in. Yeah, so there are a lot of funds out there who use, who run on that theme of like sustainable and everything, but it's uh, it's very difficult to construct a, a global portfolio, yeah, and which is like really ticking the sustainable box everywhere. It just depends on how much you look through. Yeah, if you invest in a deposit at Raisin, yeah, the deposit itself is no, not attached to any. Uh, to any unsustainable project, but you don't know where the bank, which uh, takes the deposit, actually then gives the money to. Yeah? Maybe they finance a project which is not sustainable. And it's, it's a bit similar in, in what we invest in. We invest in broad, broad capital markets, and in the S&P 500 index, there might be some companies in there you don't like, yeah? depending on the, uh, the, uh, the, the kind of filters you have for sustainability. And uh, yeah, that's it's it's not something we, we tackle directly. Okay, are there any other questions from the audience? Uh, very long day. When did you start? Oh, there's one. <laughs> Um, I, actually, I have two questions. Um, the first question relates to the regulatory sandbox. My name is Lars Twinnenbold, University of Berlin. So my first question relates to the regulatory sandbox, and I would like to ask uh, Florian and, and Daniel. Um, I think when we, when, when we want to make a judgment whether we want this or not, we should look at it not only from the regulated perspective, the regulated perspective, but also from the regulator's perspective. perspective. And in that sense, I mean, a, a regulatory sandbox might be able to solve an information problem. Because if I look at a market, in, in a, a newly developing market from a regulator's perspective, if I want to make good um, regulation, I need information. Do you think that the regulatory sandbox might be a way to provide this information to the regulator? And, and the second question goes to the whole panel. I was wondering, we are talking about inf financial decision-making and the internet, and you were talking about all these disruptions and, and everything. I mean, the internet exists not only, uh, it has been existing uh, not only for, for five years, but for 20 or 30 years. So what, why this difference in the last five years? What, is, it, is it a technological advance or is it something else? 
So on the on the regulatory sandbox, uh, I mean, I see your point, and I, I, I that it's important that the regulator is like up to speed what's on, on what's happening. So if the regulatory sandbox is set up in a way that like um, it allows you to communicate with the um, or engage with the regulator quite early in the process and get some feedback from them, yeah, like both Bafin and FCA are doing that in a, maybe not in like a in a in a really framed way yet, but uh, they already do that. And if the sandbox is about that, I think it's a good thing. If the sandbox's result is that the, the playing field is not level anymore, and you have some um, some players which operate on a on a lighter uh, regulation than others, I think it's uh, it's not good for the for the structure of the capital market. So eventually, once you are live with your product, you have to play by the rules, and everyone should have uh, obeyed the same rules. I, I, uh, I totally agree that it's, 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 it's an information flow goes both ways, and, and for us it, it was a problem for a long time now. It's, it has improved that we don't have direct access, for example, to the German regulator, because we as a deposit broker, which is a not regulated activity in Germany, uh, you know, we're not supervised by BaFin, so they would even talk to us, uh, and it would be extremely helpful to get their views on certain things that are regulated that we outsource to other partners, but that are an integral part of our business model. So that has changed in this new uh, uh, opening up of BaFin to, to fintechs. It's not yet a sandbox, but it's it's definitely an improvement. And I, I personally, for our business model, what would be a great would be a pan-European sandbox because what we what we see is that as just mentioned in Germany, it's it's not regulated in in, in Austria. You need a banking license to do our business. They're the same in Spain. Uh, uh, you need some inter intermediary licenses in other countries. So it's a it's totally wild regulation across the EU. Uh, although the, 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 the nature of the business itself is pretty simple, it's a deposit brokerage. So uh, it, would be, it would be, I think, an extremely efficient thing to have also a pan-European kind of sandboxing scheme where information flows go to the regulator and back. So the question was, what has changed in the last five years? Would you like to start with that, Ethan? In regulation? No, not in regulation, in the internet. That was the second I mean, question. The, the internet was, was there in the 90s, but we didn't see scalable capital or, or, or these services. So is it really technological advance or is it something else as well? So I think, so I, I start, so to give you a sense of like, I, I think that the startup environment has become easier to do, right? As things become more online, you have more APIs available, more approaches, people are, it's easier to get an idea out there. I had students come up with an idea in my class, just to give you a sense of how quickly this worked. For, um, so, for various reasons, US college loans you can't, uh, have fairly high interest rates, and you can't, uh, you, the banks are sort of unable technically to, to discriminate based on the quality of where you're getting your degree from. So the chance of default from Wharton is near zero, right, as opposed to other degrees where there might be higher chances of default, or Harvard Medical School or something else. So they realized that all these people had old loans, and they just offered refinancing over the internet with crowd-sourced cash going in. And they were able to raise $100 million within, within uh, four months for the, you know, starting this venture in order to do this refinancing. So I think that it becomes a snowball effect where everyone is now realizes there's huge margin available at the big banks that you can steal from. Um, it's cheap to do. Uh, and the regulation has been pushed in that direction. And I think you're just going to see this, this gather of steam. Yeah, and think about of the, uh, in the presentation on the quote from, I think it was Mark Sasta, right? Yeah. Um, on on how, how it got cheaper to, to, to start a startup. Uh, um, and yeah, multiply those numbers by 100 to do it like in banking. Yeah? Like in, in Switzerland, you, the minimum capital for a bank is 10 million Swiss francs. Yeah? And for most of the businesses we do, you need that license. Yeah? And uh, now, like with uh, yeah, the technology and regulations lightening up a bit, uh, you, you are able to, to ramp up a fintech at a fraction of a price than in the past. So first, I would say it's, it's a technological advance is that it sounds silly, but user interfaces have become much, much simpler. And my parents can now use an iPad, which was not possible like five years ago. They wouldn't touch a computer. That's an important, at least probably isn't that's an important stuff. And, and the second part is also regulatory again. So passporting, KYC, third party reliance concepts, all these kind of things just came in, uh, in, in 2013 or so. So uh, before that, it was just not possible from a regulatory perspective. I think also um, 
there's also this book by Thomas Friedman, The World is Flat, and I think what he calls uh, what has emerged is all the steroids. And uh, what he means by that is like, you know, you have now smartphones and tablets and stuff like that. And uh, also, I mean, uh, Facebook only emerged like around the, the turn of the century. So I think without that, I think it wasn't simply possible to have this kind of uh, user interaction, uh, like constantly like playing with your smartphone and going back to your PC with a big uh, box or something. And I think it was just not that much fun to do these things uh, you can do now. So I think it was just a natural um, yeah, development. Mm -hmm. And that question uh, leads to another one, which is what does that mean, that change mean for the whole financial world? What would be your take on what, what does banking, what does investing look like in 10 years from now? Sorry. What's the bank exist yeah. in 10 years? No, I, I, think, I, think, I think big banks are going to be in trouble because I think what you're seeing. So the power, the power, the, the thing has been what startups have gotten very good at doing is looking for places where there's margin, right? And then they can take, you know, they can give away eight out of ten pieces, you know, 80 percent of the margin and still be hugely profitable. And finance is full of huge margin businesses that you can steal away. And you know, and and there's so much money. You know, I, I always complain when people give me startup plans where they assume that year two they have like one percent of the market, right? Like they didn't just do it half percent the first year, one percent the second year, third. Per but in, in banking, if you have one tenth of one hundredth of a percent, there is so much money to sustain a startup company. Um, and so I think that you're going to see challenges, and I think the large banks are not built for them. Not every product, but these products that you see. There's just it just doesn't make sense. There's not there's no economy of scale versus being on the internet. So what what happens? Uh, I think you're going to see huge challenges, um, and you're already seeing salaries drop in these spaces. My students don't go in. The MBAs are not going into into you know any of the more retail based finances again. Even hedge funds. It's just going to you're going to see this continue to drop. I think. Mm -hmm. Ross, do you share that? Uh, I think absolutely. I think there's no competitive advantage uh, universal banks have. I think. Each segment of a bank uh, can be done much more uh, efficient, with much more scale by a fintech company. I think the only thing that uh, commercial or uh, traditional banks still have is they have a banking license. I think even there, like there are specialized providers who can only provide the banking license, license and much better technological services to a fintech company. I think these banks will survive in the end, and I think Deutsche Bank won't exist. Maybe that's a special place. <laughs> okay, are you are you okay with the role of the hero as fintech? <laughs> so I think it's it's, it's so it's definitely true that the, the role of big banks will will uh, diminish at the same time. So there will be a disintermediation of the value chain, of course. Product providers and distribution partners will will, will not be the same. There will be platforms that will integrate uh, uh, third-party products. But there will also be a network effect, and we see that in our business very clearly. So we're luckily the, the largest, and we uh, and, and we get the new banks because we're largest, and we get the customers because we have the most banks. So it's uh, there are networks effect in that in that uh, new environment too. It might lead to concentration again, uh, I think. Um, and I think another thing that that was mentioned many times today is uh, we all have an overflow of information. We have attention deficits. The key success factor will be to keep it simple and as user-friendly as possible and to make financial decisions you know, within a second, split second, and, and the, the provider who does that best, I think, will prevail. Mm -hmm. Well, I would like to come back to the quote I introduced you with, which was that he wants to become big. So if fintechs one day are big, will they have the same problems like the big banks today? It's, I think, a challenge for every. It's a good challenge for every successful startup yeah, to stay a startup as uh, as long as possible. And it's about it's about the DNA of your team. It's about the, how modular your technology is. Like, are you already building legacy from day one? Yeah, and uh, are you willing to to reinvent yourselves on an ongo ongoing basis and really cannibalize existing business you might have? Uh, that's a challenge. Um, the bigger you get, uh, the the more you have it. And at some point, uh, yeah, new startups will emerge. <laughs> um, but uh, that, uh, that's far away. And I think uh, there is, as you said, like there is a, a huge opportunity out there. There is so much margin out there, which is let's be so quote right. But uh, your margin is 
my opportunity. This kind of applies for uh, for for everyone here, and um, yeah, that's the challenge. Okay. Are there any questions left from you? No, not yet. So then I still have one single question to Lars, who's the only one who's not. Uh, <laughs> inside one of the fintech uh, spheres, in which one would you invest your own money? Crowdfunding, Salvo, <laughs> or Raisin? What would you be I your pick? Like, uh, as the Nobel Prize winners, I would just uh, invest in my pension fund. <laughs> 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 which may be a disaster. <laughs> so thank you very much, and thanks for your attention. <laughs>